Hello and uh, welcome in today's lecture. Today we shall be talking about nomadic pastoralism and environment perspectives. In today's lecture, we will attempt to present a coherent account of the interchange that worked between these nomadic communities and the environment in which they survived and became functional and will also focus on emergence of pastoralism, nomadic communities and environment, nomadic pastoralism and settled communities. The early stage among the human groups directly relates with the nomadic ways of living and its association with the practice of pastoralism known as nomadic pastoralism. The origins of this type of living, like the other early stages of human social formations, are covered with haze. The pastoral necessities of wandering in quest of sufficient food drove nomadism among these human communities. Similarly, their pastoralism was led by the need to have a consistent supply of food, the animal meat unaffected by the vagaries of the weather. This confluence gave rise to nomadic pastoralism as a defining stage in human societies that have coexisted with different social groups since their origin. Emergence of Pastoralism Early evidence on human groups and their environment suggests that the animals found nearby were killed for food, aided by stone tools and utensils used in slaughtering and skinning in addition to hunting. When the animal population in the area became exhausted, the group was forced to relocate to a location where there was an adequate quantity of animals again. The fossil remains found from the Narbada region indicate six varieties that lived from the Middle Pleistocene age vis-à-vis -vis Sus nomadicus, Bos nomadicus, Alphas hysrodicus, Equus nomadicus, Hexa protodon nomadicus, and Stegodon insignis genesia. Similarly, fossils that Pravara River, a tributary of Godavari, produces evidence on Bos nomadicus, Equus nomadicus, and Elphus nomadicus. These species are broadly equivalent to wild ox, horse, and elephant variations that ultimately became domesticated species. Human hunting groups frequently obtained their food from the same hut, where they concentrated mostly on larger members of the hut. During the operation, young members of the herd often were captured alive and kept in cage. This approach appeared to have sown the seeds of animal domestication, which would have led to the practice of pastoral. The hunting gathering communities had begun to focus on some species of large animals for diet very early on, and wild sheep and goats were heavily hunted during this period. This approach protected younger individuals and female reproductive members so that this source of nourishment would not run dry. The accidental capture of a few younger animals, as well as the expertise gained in taming them, indicated an entirely new way of living based on the steady supply of animal food. This would have resulted in greater degree of dependence, in fact, mutual dependence between people and animals. The three main factors in the lifestyle of hunter-gatherers would have helped domestication of animals to begin as a regular practice. The movement of animal populations is being constrained or restricted due to a variety of environmental variables, increasing the likelihood of capture and captivity by human groups. Possibilities for breeding the animals in captivity, so assisting human groups in maintaining an optimal population for regular food consumption, control of captive animal feeding in order to improve breeding of stock. The archaeological evidence of early animal domestication is both sparse and imprecise. Generally, it is impossible to tell the difference between wild and domesticated animal bones. Domestication took a long time and the earliest indication of domestication is of a dog, but it was most likely not for food. It was widely assumed that sheep and goats were the first species to be domesticated for food purposes. 
the behavior of the animals was important feature that would have played a big influence in domesticating them. According to Andrew Simth, Pastoralism in Africa, Johannesburg, 1992, the first domesticated animals came from better disciplined wild herds in arid conditions where animal movements were easier to manage. Some animals were extremely difficult to domesticate due to their behavioral habits. The sheep and goats are small animals with good herding habits. It may have been easier to maintain them in captivity since their habits of living in herds assisted the kidnapped flock in adapting the captive settings. Interaction with humans who cared for them in captivity led in the development of a symbiotic relationship with people over time. It became easy to slaughter surplus meals for food once captivity breeding began. The captive breeding also assisted humans in discovering their utility for milk production as well as byproducts such as skin for garments, tents and leather for other uses. The availability of meadows for herds to use as pasture has also been proposed as a significant element in the establishment of pastoralism. Many pastoralist livestock species originated in South Asia, including zebu and thorse cattle, buffalo, kemu, sheep and goats. They, like other animals, would have been hunted for flesh and other items like hides and bones. Their normal diurnal and herding behaviors would have made hunting quite simple for them. Because most of these species needed open, well-watered terrain, it's likely that they were a valuable resource worth depending against other groups of humans. There has been much discussion regarding India's shortage of grasslands. There are climatic and edific grasslands which occur at extremes of cold and aridity, shallow soil, and deep water logging. Grassland is defined as any habitat that does not support trees or plants. These grasslands have supported different groups of big grazing herbivores, including some endemic species. However, these constitute only a minor percentage of India's land area, the most of which is covered by forested vegetation, forest woodland, or shrubland. The presence of a tree layer does not eliminate grasses. There can still be a significant grass cover under these trees. Well, it's traditionally, one associates African pastoralism with grasslands, the Masa of East Africa being a prime example, not all pastoralist livestock populations browse as do sheep and cattle in Indian conditions. The severe nine-month dry season, typical of peninsular India's Deccan and Western Ghats, cannot produce palatable grass cover for medium-sized herbivores. Browse, which comprises of edible plants, often legumes, shrubs, and as per sizes for species and fallen tree litter, constitutes a key element of the diet. These grazing components, as well as grass-standing crop, are more prevalent in open forested communities than in closed wooded communities. When compared to open thorn bush and dry deciduous communities, dense moist deciduous forests offer minimal feed at the ground and shrubs layer levels. Therefore, their carrying capacity for terrestrial mammals is poor. It's effortlessly possible, therefore, to imagine pastoralist people in Indian forests. Nowadays, we are witnessing same with the Jammuwala buffalo herders in the once dense Shivalik and Himalaya forests. Contingent on looping tree leaf and in drier Aravali and Saurashtra hill forests with distinct Gujar communities, lopping trees and shrubs for mixed cattle and buffalo herds. According to Brain M. Fagan, the commencement of the practice of domestication had a far-reaching impact from an eco-environmental perspective. Domestication means a genetic selection emphasizing unique characteristics of continued use to the domesticator. Wild sheep have no wool, 
wild cows only provide milk for their offsprings and wild chickens do not lay extra eggs. Isolating wild populations for selective breeding under human supervision could result in change in wool bearing, lactation or egg production. The clearest evidence of animal domestication in India comes from the Adhamgarh hill in the Narmada basin. The site is actually a rock shelter with Mesolithic stone tools and other artifacts. Microlithic tools, animal bones and ceramics are found in a thick layer of black soil that varies in depth from 15 to 150 centimeters. The animal bones found in the excavation comprise the domestic dog Canis familiarius, Indian humped cattle, Bos indicus, water buffalo, Babulus bobelis, goat, Capra hercus agagaris, domestic sheep, Ovis orientalis vignai blight, Res domesticus, pig, Sus scopha cristatus. Another fascinating type of proof derived from graphic images on rock shelters is the employment of domesticated horses to transport wheeled vehicles. A set of rock shelters known as the Morhana Pahar group can be found near Mirzapur in Uttar Pradesh. Microlithic tools have also been discovered at the same site. Nomadic communities and pastoralism. Some hunting gathering tribes have observed how animals were domesticated and nurtured since the beginning of the practice of pastoralism. It has been shown that animals keeping was a highly prevalent activity among the settled agriculturalists who have adopted a way of life in which pastoralism was accorded a supplementary status. A comparison of the two forms of sustenance is a useful beginning point for understanding the circumstances that may have given rise to nomadism among pastoralists as opposed to a properly settled mode of living among agriculturists. The pastoralists and the agriculturists depend on land and water resources for their sustenance. The agriculturists utilize the productivity of the land for raising crop periodically with the help of irrigating potential of nearby water resources. The pastoralists too utilize the productivity of the land but depend on nature to replenish the consumed resources. The herds of animals kept by them use the resources of land as pastures for grazing purpose but pastoralists do not resort to any adopted measure for rejuvenating the foray of fixed areas of land. Similarly, water resources are utilized immediately without any concerted effort to modify them. Thus, the sedimentism necessary by agriculturists manipulate land is not required by pastoralists. The ongoing need for extra grazing land for pastoralists' herds necessitates their constant movement in quest of new pasture regions from one location to the next. This gives rise to nomadic societies and early pastoral activities are often connected with them. Nomadic pastoralists used animal herds as resource bases and the size of their herds was determined by the amount of regularly accessible pastorage. Individualism was stronger in the pastoral economy than in the agricultural economy. The management of pastures with rigorous laws about the periodicity of usage and seasonal rights of usage may have been the principal community issue among nomadic pastoralists. Environmental and seasonal factors appear to have played a significant impact in the lives of early nomadic pastoralists. Unmanageable distances traveled in pursuit of suitable pasture and water supplies would have destabilized the group. This would have resulted in some form of territoriality, although inadequately defined. As a result, interaction between distinct territorial groups as well as conflict over territorial authorities may have been feasible. Settled Communities and Nomadic Pastoralism The adoption of a nomadic mode of living by pastoralists will be discussed as under. 
hunter gatherers gradually evolved in apostolic society while agricultural sedentism occurred simultaneously it is clear that nomadic pastoralists did not live in isolation from other cultures and would have kept in touch with them as romila thapar suggests some pastoralists were nomadic while others were semi sedentary occasionally pursuing minor agriculture the majority of pastoralists were part of the trade system that brought them into contact with cultivators and others the archaeological sites containing traces of domesticated animals indicate that the size of the herd kept by pastoralists was not excessively huge was within manageable boundaries and was therefore prone to creating ecto symbiotic ties with neighboring groups producing cereals both pastoralists and growers benefited from the arrangement the pastoralists cereal needs were met by farming communities as a result the pastoralists were able to forego the additional labor intensive effort of planting food crops they could divert the majority of their effort to keeping the animal herds in check in exchange the farmers received a steady supply of meat wool and skin over time there would be a proliferation in the diversity of animals partly in response to a demand established by agriculturists the herd was also encouraged to visit the post harvest fields so that the stubs left over from the harvesting operation could be cleaned and animal dropping could be used as manure the periodic migration of nomadic pastoralists to agricultural villages would have resulted in nomads supplying grazing services for the cultivating livestock groups this service although with a few other goods may have been exchanged for agricultural fodder it is worth noting that a different climate condition in peninsular india gave rise to a different type of development though the area is generally mountainous the drainage system of the main rivers has been such that pasture land in patches but in great condition has been available all throughout from the west to east from their inception the communities in such region demonstrated a strong desire to keep a substantial cattle population keeping livestock was not as difficult as relying only on agriculture such frequent movements bring pastorals into contact with communities of high civilization through which craftsmen products find their way pastoralist societies often sought out big pastures in the vicinity of their habitat they would even travel to other areas in search of good pastures resulting in nomadic tendencies that found a home with pastoralists because of the population state of pastoral villages agriculture was rarely undertaken rainfall therefore had only a minor role to play against being a key feature for the settled agriculturists the maintenance of large animal herds was labor intensive but was manipulated with the help of the elastic nature of resources when needed the herd was reduced in size through gifts or repayments to agriculturists the size would soon be restored through reproduction a kinship network based on lineage seems to have guided the pastoral communities the maintenance of large animal herds was labor intensive but it could be managed thanks to the resources flexibility when appropriate the herd size was reduced through gifts or repayments to agriculturists the original size would be quickly recreated by reproduction the pastoral groups appear to have been guided by a kinship network centered on lineage with this we come to the conclusion of today's lecture hope you have understood every aspect of the subject see you in some other class till then goodbye and good luck